Okay, thank you all for coming. Some, some, some faces I know, uh, some faces I don't. It's nice to be here. I've been uh, travelling around the UK for, for a, and a little bit with little forays into Sweden and France as well for a couple of months while I'm on sabbatical and talking to lots of different people, so it's been quite a lot of fun. It's been the longest I've been back in the UK since I moved, 10, uh, 11 years ago to Canada. Um, today, what I'm talking about is essentially the sort of skeleton of a research project which only started last year so it's still sort of uh, evolving shall we say and it also has one or two things that I've done before um, as illustrations and um, some things drawn from um, uh, a collective project into, uh, of an edited book which uh, including a chapter by Joe Minor who's in the room so she can speak to her own I'll probably uh, I'll, I'll lie about what your chapter says and then, you know, you can get it. Uh, Andy Carvin is also, also here, uh, from Manchester is also here. Um, but for me, the context of a, it's a little bit about how I came to think about uh, climate change politics in relation to culture. Um, partly this is sort of a general sort of uh, approach that, um, you know, what I, my, my take on what the term cultural political economy might mean, um, which is a term that gets used by lots and lots of people and uh, a very, very elaborate schema by Bob Jessup in particular. Um, I use it a little bit more loosely to say that if we ask the question for me, what drives both, um, at a fairly general level, both uh, a variety of forms of environmental degradation, but climate change uh, as the principal focus of that for, for my work over 25 years or so, um, and on the other hand, what drives the patterns of responses, then I see there's, two, there's a twin set of processes, an interrelated set of processes. One is the process of accumulation that reasonably conventional political economy perspectives can give us some take on, and the other is the process of the, the, the ways by which they, the practices that are involved in accumulation, that are central to accumulation and are simultaneously central to a range of patterns of environmental degradation, um, are also those things that around which lots and lots of very deep meanings come to be attached in daily life. Um, so automobility for me for a long time was a sort of central thing to hang that on, um, and that's and, and that's in some senses a, a general perspective of thinking about why um, it's also incredibly intractable because those two things are intertwined, but also some hints about how uh, states, private actors, a variety of actors, NGOs, etc., a variety of actors try to um, work within the twin logics of those two parts of how the world is organised. Um, this project is really, I mean, the last project was more on the PE side, and I was looking about carbon markets and uh, commodification of, of carbon and so on, which I'm sort of doing bits of work on. Um, this project, new project, is more on the seaside, but I'm sort of assuming implicitly that they're always intertwined. Um, another context is, is uh, the literature on tr transitions, which I know there's people in the room who work on. Um, and doing and, and wanting to ask two types of questions about transitions. Well, this is a, this is really a joke. It actually doesn't. It does much less conceptual work than I than I than it probably it, it, uh, than I think it. I'd like it to do, but I don't know if you can see that. But it's uh, uh, it's sort of a. It wasn't. I've seen it in context. People talking about transitions where you've got you know the high carbon uh, complex path dependent system, and you've got your low carbon one, and you've got this transition, and it says uh, if you can't read it, it says then a miracle occurs. Um, and the, with the guy saying, I think you should be a bit more explicit about step two. Of course, the other thing about that is that there is no single site of that quote's miracle. It's not a very good term, obviously, conceptually. Um, but it's, it's asking about what are the, the many sites that might, uh, and processes that go on that might trigger that transformation. In particular, the, the things I'm interested in, and, and both on my own and in other sorts of uh, uh, in collaborations, is on the one hand thinking about the, 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 the questions of subjectivities and practices, which a lot of the transitions literature doesn't is sort of abstract from in a fairly sort of <coughs> macro aggregating sort of way. And in the context of this uh, um, collective book I'm doing with Harriet, Harriet Bulkley and um, Johannes Strippel at London University in Sweden, to mind, we use the sort of uh, the twin. Uh, you know, alliteration always being good, the, the notion of devices and desires, the ways in which the subjectivities that, you know, and, and practices, that the things that we do in daily life, the meanings we attach to those, are organised via a range of devices, both individual objects like cups and assemblages of objects 
and so on, and they're also mobilised via a set of desires for those. Um, I think Joe's, for example, chapter talks a lot about how desires for particular forms of orange juice uh, end up uh, combined with those assemblages of supermarkets and logistical systems and so on, combined to sort of make it mean that even people who, quote, want to eat, drink low carbon end up not doing so. Um, and a lot of that is also associated with a lot of when you look at the sort of, not all, but a lot of the transitions literature, then when it comes to the level of, quote, individual behaviour, it's got a very individualist um, behavioural account of what, um, how people operate. Um, the key question for me in relation to this, which is sort of a different to a lot of the sociologists who work on this, someone like Elizabeth Shove, best known, is that uh, is it not, the focus is not so much on the practices themselves, but about what happens politically when those sub subjectivities and practices get called into question. And what are the sorts of conflicts in particular that, that, that are produced by that way of, um, uh, by, by those, those calling into question of the normality of driving, flying, air conditioning, heating, ways that we cook, things that we eat, etc, etc. And that for me is becoming a key political question about the types of processes that might go on there in that so-called Europe. Um, the second context is also that the, um, the, in general those, the, the, most of the people working in the socio-technical transitions literature, um, the, the question of politics, the question of power and authority, gets more or less elided. Um, it's not a, uh, and in particular the question of conflict. Um, in the collected book we call this dissent, just so we can keep the alliteration going, but uh, um, uh, uh, it's obviously central to um, uh, political analysis. Um, and there's really two forms, uh, there's two, two, two questions about politics to raise in that sort of question about the, the, what, the, the what might be central to when we ask those political questions about how a transition might, or transitions plural, might occur. One is the modes of governmentality, what, sort, what forms of authority are involved in trying to shape subjectivities such that they might shift um, towards being more low carbon. Um, so I've got a bunch of uh, projects and I'm going to talk about one of those that we've already done some work on um, where we, mostly the Johannes Strippel framed around the notion of climate or carbon governmentality. Um, how it would, you know, do deliberate initiatives to try and intervene in the ways that people organise their own uh, meanings of their daily lives um, to becoming more low carbon. Um, it's also important to... Uh, um, emphasise there that when, when people, most, most of the time when we talk about uh, uh, subjectivity and governmentalities where people tend to talk about individual human beings and in particular in this concept we get to be talking about consumers very very rapidly as if they're the only type of relevant subjectivity but um, and, and actually the, the, the example I'm going to talk about in a bit falls into that mm -hmm. trap but, um, but nevertheless, certainly in the collective book and in other parts of the project, we're looking at other sorts of sites of which types of subjects, you know, uh, university professors could be one, but it's not on my list. But uh, the examples from the book that we've got, workers in Vattenfall, a big uh, Swedish energy company, supermarket managers, again, in Joe's chapter, builders, we've got a lot of chapters on, on housing and so on. Um, and there's also multiple forms of governing subjects. There's no single site at which these initiatives to try and govern uh, um, <coughs> Uh, different, uh, and, and shape different subjectivities um, is occurring and there is not, not a single way in which that power or that authority is being exercised. So you've got it variously via new forms of calculative regimes, a lot of stuff about ca counting carbon in different contexts and governing how people operate through that calculative device, uh, through peer pressure and competition, through traditional incentives in some policy contexts, the fiscal incentives and so on, building new infrastructures and so on. All of these govern us in slightly different ways and um, I don't have anything to say about those empirically yet, but that's sort of the thing I'm trying to, going to be trying to look at. Um, this is one I like, I don't know if anybody's seen this, come across this example, it's just as a try example, to bring some, not try, but uh, it's actually quite an interesting one to bring that together, where, has anybody come across solar roadways? Yeah, okay, so this, this and, and at least how it's filtered into the popular consciousness, this may not be the, uh, there may be much more to the story, but with this one, uh, there was a video that went round about, I'd say about eight or nine months ago, maybe slightly long, long ago, of these two sort of incredibly uh, enthusiastic, um, uh, popular mechanic reading 
uh, American sort of uh, tech geeks who built these hexagonal shaped solar panels that would, were, were durable enough to make as a road surface. So you have a solar powered road. Um, the video is, if you've not seen the video, is hilarious. And I certainly have one of the things in, in the context of this grant, I'd love if I could find an MA student or a PhD student who wanted to do a project on sort of the gadget boy masculinities and how that deals and how those uh, feet create openings actually for low carbon in innovations in some contexts. You know, just sit and read Popular Mechanics or Fast Car or what the hell and see what happens when those things start to take low carbon devices. And that video is just, I mean, you could write an entire thesis chapter just about one video. I think. The, 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 the thing that sort of then popped up about four months later, which is that the Dutch actually then built a, a bike path based on, based on this technology. About, uh, and all of the American tech geeks said, oh, 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 you're just making this look bad now, because they actually went and built it. Um, so there's, there's, I think that's a, that's a useful sort of... Uh, Example that I, I like as a way, one way of thinking about this that, that the, we might find, I suppose the main point is that we might find all sorts of multiple complicated subjects or unanticipated sorts of subjects that might actually create openings for low carbon that we wouldn't assume. And you wouldn't be assumed to be looking at basically people who watch Top Gear for, for fun to be necessarily the sources of where that type of innovation might occur. But nevertheless, in some context, at least it does. Might be possible. So there's two instances of these processes. On the one hand, the sort of carbon governmentality process, and on the other hand, uh, uh, aspects of, po uh, of cultural politics, climate change, and the other is the sort of uh, conflicts over the attempts to generate new sort of, uh, or uh, the cultural conflicts about low carbon transitions that are, that, are, that are done some work on already, and I'm going to talk about that more on the first one. Um, you might see now that I'm talking about carbon dieting that the, uh, the, the, the faint background is a picture of the earth on, a, on a, something that, uh, unfortunately I've been two weeks, in, two weeks, two months in England, I think I might be slightly closer to that, the, the, uh, that shirt with the, or the belly inside that shirt than I was two months ago, but that's, uh, um, I'll come to that, that, that particular image in a bit. So carbon dieting on the one hand, on the other, uh, I'll, I'll unpack the word intensification because it's a very specific um, North American bureaucratic term, but one focusing on the question of how do people try and shape new low carbon subjects, and on the other, on to what types of conflicts um, erupt in various contexts. This, this paper, this, which is nearly, well, it's more or less done, we, get, we just need to sort of spend two hours on Skype and a day each finishing off a uh, paper with Johanna Strippel called On Carbon Dieting. Um, uh, as one part, one specific example of what we would call a carbon governmentality initiative. Um, efforts to reasonably self-consciously to get people to internalise in some way or other a, a model of way, a way of being in the world that shifts their daily practices towards being more low carbon. Um, we we exact, elaborated a few of these in a more general paper in Society in Space about four years ago called My Space. Um, and the two sorts of questions we explore there is on the one hand, how is carbon dieting developed as a set of practices, uh, governing practices, <coughs> and what sorts of governmental practices and, and, and what types of subjects are being formed by different variants of this carbon dieting discourse. And so we tried to map um, uh, the, the various different initiatives, the various different ways it was used and the various different agents involved. It emerged initially in first uses around about 2004 or five. Um, and then it sort of evolved reasonably quickly up to about 2010, and I'd say it's not, it's not necessarily been picked up in a way since then. Um, so it might be, you know, a, a, an example of a, a, of a way of trying to govern carbon, uh, carbon sub subjectivities. So could, could you maybe fails. Just first explain what it is, carbon yeah. dieting? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. So, so, so that's the sort of map, and it starts by which by by a bunch of. Actors mostly within the climate, within explicitly within climate change, of attempting to produce websites, uh, guidebooks, um, sort of a variety of sort of tools that that get people to think about their carbon consuming or producing practices in the same manner as a diet. Uh, so instead of counting calories. Um, in the, with the minutiae detail that, that, that somebody in a diet would be expected to carry, uh, count calories, um, you count carbon. 
so these books went a bit beyond the sort of general carbon calculator that were already reasonably well available and said, well, okay, it's not enough to just say, take your electricity bill and calculate the carbon from that. We need to know the carbon embedded in every single practice, every, you know, every cup, every, every drink in the cup, every uh, way that people may navigate their way around a, a city when they're moving, every uh, choice they make on a daily basis gets intensively managed in the same way as in, 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 uh, in dieting. So that metaphor of ways in which uh, people were governing themselves was taken very seriously. Um, and so they, so people within the client field were sort of drawing on that already well existing apparatus of you know twelve step programs and uh, diet regimes and you know etc 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 to to develop a similar sort of model. But what you what you saw quite quickly and initially this was a, so it was a dieting. It wasn't just about food. It was about all of your carbon emitting practices. However, because because there was a dieting metaphor in it, what we saw also then that a whole set of actors started to get in with different variants for it. And earlier, Sean, you had people like, you had the, the, in, in other sort of environmental discourses, but not necessarily strictly climate, you had the 100 mile diet of the food marks people doing their variants. You had cookbook writers creating the low carb, you can still buy a low carb diet, well, they, mean, they don't mean low carb, they mean low carb, you know, diet, diet book, uh, cooking books. Celebrity chefs, especially in the United States, got in on the act and they produced a number of celebrity, both TV shows and, um, uh, and cookbooks. Um, where what that, what the effect, one of the effects of that was, was to transform carbon dieting into thinking about managing food related carbon. So it's, a, it's, it's both a narrowing of the, the agenda but also changing the type of subject that's doing that. So if a low carbon subject is one who's obsessed about their food. Um, you also had, at the same sort of time, a bunch of religious organisations, notably uh, sort of like what I would call low Protestant, the Quakers, Methodists, uh, United Church and so on. Um, who, who did a version which was called Carbon Fasting. And so they, did, they, they had the slogans and they still actually, some of those organisers still organise, go on a low carbon diet for Lent, you know, give up meat for Lent, as part, as a specifically low carbon articulated as that. Um, so they, again, buying into pre-existing sort of discourses about how people govern themselves and adapting it to the climate change uh, context. You also then, once it had become the, the, the religious organisations were, were going, keeping with the sort of focus on carbon emissions as a whole, you can go up your car for Lent as well as giving up meat for Lent. Um, but, the, but within the food, once it got sort of narrowed towards food, you then also had other groups coming in, so urban designers in particular and health professionals on the other hand, um, and mostly those were in the UK, at least the cases that we found, instances that we found, um, that uh, use a pre-existing discourse, if anybody's come across the term obesogenic environments, may well have done a few, you know, um, then they use that discourse to, to, to develop what we call a sort of climate obesity discourse. And they, in that, that has variants. Yeah, so that's what you, what you had at this time, some of the health professionals in particular, this one at the bottom, this one is a sort of a publicity campaign, um, but this one is actually in a scientific journal of uh, a public health journal. Um, as just a sort of illustration of the argument being made. But there were a bunch of arguments there being made in 2007, 8, 9 ish. People started making the argument that fat people should make, pay, pay more to fly on planes. Um, they, uh, you know, they're making a very clear uh, argument that obesity was a cause of climate change. Um, more commonly, which is there, which is a bit small, is, to, is, the, is the figure, the, the, the thing to this, the, the, the legend to this figure is. Uh, an inflamed body in an inflamed environment, is there a common etiology? So it's not saying that fat people cause climate change, but, but, but uh, obesogenic environments cause both obesity and climate change. So the fact that, you know, especially in North America, where if you're living in high sprawl, sprawled out environments, um, where, where driving is more or less compulsory, and those are simultaneously um, reducing the amount of, uh, of exercise people get in their daily lives and increasing greenhouse gas emissions. Can I ask yep. you, because your slide had the title Proliferation of, yeah. uh, so I was just wondering what the indicator is of proliferation, because in Europe, this, I've, I've not, it doesn't have much traction as far as I know no. in Europe, so maybe is this more prominent in the US, do you think, well, we found, here? Or we, found, um, we found examples of it across both, um, 
Uh, I mean, what I would say about this is, is that I'm not, we weren't necessarily interested in does this work? Has this, you know, has this gained traction? We're more interested in this, what, what, does it, what does something like this reveal about the ways in which people try and govern carbon? I mean, they, they might fail lots of times, um, but it's not necessarily, it's, there's still value in looking at something that fails. Even in terms of its governing rationality and so on. Yeah, I thought the time may well yeah. mis misled by the title. I thought the claim was this is getting more prominent. No, no. The proliferation in this scene is you start with an initial idea and then it becomes more more diverse, not necessarily bigger, but, but it gets taken up by different actors in different contexts, and that transforms both the discourse but also the way in which people are trying to shape um, how people operate. Um, um, but but so but, but within the sort of f focus on climate and, and health and so on that gets articulated by particularly these combination of actors, sometimes it's a more structural discourse about urban. It becomes a discourse about urban planning, um, and others it becomes a sort of individual responsibility discourse. It might be that the I don't know. I'd have to go back and read all the, 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 the stuff that we collected. That, that actually you get more of a. This is this is actually more prevalent in in North America. Because they recognise that you know actually people are completely dependent on the car, whereas in the European context, it's less obvious that that's the case. So people become more focused on why are these people still driving, even though there's great buses and everything's only two miles away. So, I, but I, that's a hunch rather than um, something I could really claim. The, the main point is to say that there's lots of ideas that the, the you know sort of in. Uh, some people talk about this in terms of sort of experimental governance. Nobody knows which ones the, in advance which, which one of these schemes might work. And so people have lots of different agents in different contexts have been experimenting with different ways of trying to govern carbon. Even the failures, I think, in that, in that sense, are pretty um, Anyway, but there's, I, won't, I won't say too much about this, but what, but what we try to do then is just to sort of formalise a bit more. How do those different variants, climate diet, climate fitness, climate obesity, we haven't done the fasting one yet, um, how do they? What? 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 Uh, what do they? How do they construct climate as a problem to be managed? In what? In, uh, in relation to individuals, what techniques do they use? Um, uh, and what types of subjects do they try and create? But I won't say too much about that. Now. Um, what we saw, what we see in that is, is that whether or not it succeeds, whether or not it takes off, and so on, and still people trying to uh, work with this sort of an argument. But I think it would be interesting to follow these up in other contexts, especially ones that maybe become more prominent, is a sort of set of dynamics as the discourse, discourses and actors articulate with each other and problematize climate change in slightly different ways. Um, and therefore, other people, some people are going to be more or less attracted to it. Uh, um, so you've got these processes of appropriation of climate change and by climate change act, uh, governing actors of pre-existing discourses outside of dieting or obesogenic environments. And then you get the adaptation of discourses and the bandwagoning effects. Um, and it's not really possible when you start at the beginning to, to predict how that's going to unfold. Um, uh, sometimes what ha very clearly happens is that it becomes a really hyper-individualising uh, discourse, which is the sort of initial logic of dieting itself. Um, but in other times you can see it also opening out to things like urban planning and so on. Uh, the second one, which is in a, a slightly more uh, embryonic stage of research and, and is a North American specific thing, although you can see it, or at least it's more extreme in North America and it would be similar in Australia, um, wherever you've got very low density cities compared to most European cities. Um, it's pretty ubiquitous in policy context to say that um, density is key to, uh, in a, in, to, to urban um, uh, to, 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 to being able to have relatively low carbon emissions in an urban context, you've got to have relatively high degrees of density in order to get people walking, cycling, using public transport and so on. Um, that's a fairly straightforward uh, claim which is pretty widely accepted. Of course, therefore, the challenge is in a, in a North American context where you don't have that density is that you need to be trying to increase density in a way that in a lot of European contexts that doesn't need to be necessarily a Key, get, key, old, key aim. Um, you also look across most North American municipalities now have very, and have had for quite a while, even prior to where um, climate change becoming a sort of internal part of the policy processes, 
um, have established um, uh, increasing density, urban density as a policy goal. They, they succeeded in doing that very effectively, but it's nevertheless pretty much mo all, all cities in North America have that as a, as a, uh, uh, as a aim. Um, in one or two places, I think you can start to see climate change as a sort of driver of that normative goal for, for cities, but not in that many places. Nevertheless, what, you, what, what you've got is a, contra, a sort of contrast between that official aim that most cities have and the day-to-day -day decisions about where do, where do houses get built. Um, and so what happens when, when things are uh, articulated in the name of increasing density, the, what the term intensification usually means in the bureaucratic processes, um, is that you've, you've got a, a, a whole set of conf conflictual processes which, are, which I think are interesting to explore and we're sort of starting to do that with a, with a student at, at Ottawa at the moment uh, about what, and to ask the question, what is it that gets people really upset when condos go up in their neighbourhood or where, where their neighbour te uh, tears down a single home and puts up two or three houses on the same lot? What is, what is it that gets them really upset because that becomes the sort of key trigger for those sorts of conflicts? And so we've been um, collecting, first of all, the first stage was to collect the uh, newspaper articles since 2001 using the key term intensification. It ha it's a happy accident. I think it's, the, it's the most effective keyword search I've ever done in 25 years where, where every single article was exactly on what we wanted, which is quite lucky. Um, uh, and uh, and Marissa, who's, uh, the, the student working on this, is also now working, looking, collecting all the stuff which is going to be for a uh, master's thesis on um, the community association newsletters and, talking, and looking at their discourse. Um, uh, and mostly what we're going to be then doing, which has just started and what I'll talk about in a minute, is the sort of preliminary uh, cut of this, of some of the themes coming out, is to analyse the discourse, to look at precisely what, strategy, what rhetorical strategies, what fears and hopes uh, do people mobilise, either in favour or against these sorts of building projects. Um, We'll combine that a little bit, which is just um, uh, with, with analysing the sort of networks of, of actors involved, who have some social network analysis of who is mobilising art. For example, to see do you have a, a, cl a cluster of the property developers and two or three pro development councillors across the city promoting them all uh, versus lots and lots of disparate local groups uh, protecting their own patch, or do you have something else? I'm going on in terms of the organisation of that conflict. Um, and also um, uh, to, to look, actually, uh, Marissa has a, has a geography undergraduate background and done a fair bit of GIS, so she's, gonna, she's geocoding at the moment to see where in the city do these things occur and how does that, what types of the demographics of those neighbourhoods, what, who, to, to say something about who might be involved in, in those. Uh, um, in, those com in those conflicts, and I'll come back to that point in a minute. We'll see if we need to uh, about the interviews later. If, in terms of the themes, what we see is a number of conflicts which don't, which are, you know, sort of, uh, some of them are not surprises at all. I think some of them are sort of, tell you what I'm going to try and take out of it is, is the, uh, is, is, we we'll see the surprises where we can, but you've got a number of different oppositional strategies to uh, intensification. You've got uh, a sort of set of stories about developers versus local communities, um, and these are mostly come from, coming from left, leftish councillors, Diane Holmes. Um, you've also got a right strategy that is sort of more planners against freedom. You know, you, the, the planners are trying to make the city more dense, but real people want to live out in the suburbs and you can't stop them, and they want to drive their cars and have their single family homes. Um, Councillor Denley. Um, and the property developers tend to use that approach. And then you have slightly more opportunistic, where mostly centrist councillors, Jim Watson is the current mayor of Ottawa, uh, Mathieu Fleury, um, uh, but also down, there's a downtown city centre councillor, where it's really dependent on uh, the particular situation in those, and they're all uh, relatively opportunistic. Fleury is in the, in the uh, it would be the equivalent, the nearest equivalent would be whatever ward we're sitting in now because it's, it's the ward that the University of Ottawa is in uh, and there's a lot of student housing and a lot of the opposition is organised around um, dirty, smelly students making lots of noise, as you might expect. Um, the, the proponents, which, uh, when, when they talk about why, you know, why it's great to have 
these, this new development, this condo building, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, they don't talk about, um, they actually don't talk about the, the economics very much at all. They don't talk about jobs, they don't talk about um, those things. They focus on the sort of type of neighborhood that is enabled by high density. And they, talk, uh, they, they focus um, on mobilizing desire for that way of living in the city. Um, Self-consciously, I would think, recognizing that that's actually a, a form of desire they have to construct. They know at some level that people like being able to wander along the street and have a nice cafe and a few good shops, but because it's actually not people's daily experience, they're having to construct the desire for it. Uh, for the diverse shops you get when you can walk along the street, uh, for the creative buildings, that they talk a lot about the creativity of the buildings they are building themselves, um, partly a sort of modernizing move to construct the opposition as sort of backward and anti-modern and so on. Um, and the liveliness of streets, that, that sort of terminology comes up quite a lot. Um, a, a, a common theme in, across those three various, those three strat st strategies of opposition um, is the phrase, the character of the neighbourhood. Um, uh, and so a lot of people talk about heritage, they will refer to the height of buildings um, as being an obstruction to their, their, uh, their being inappropriate for the neighbourhood. Um, and this is particularly, uh, well we haven't done the, the, the GIS yet, but this will be in particular older neighbourhoods, older in the Ottawa context means houses built in the 1890s, 1900s. A um, uh, couple of examples there up. Um, this is the, uh, the, maybe the most extreme one is the second one. Um, this is to do with a development quite near the University of Ottawa in the city centre, um, mostly for student housing, but by a private developer, not by the university itself. Um, one of the opponents, we will witness a moral decay of society and community living. Um, not to say that in a really posh, from a proper southern English voice, but anyway, um, I don't know what that voice the person said it has. Um, and you see quite a lot of that sort of thing about how the community's values, the neighbourhood values, will be destroyed by this or that development. Um, at, at, one, in one, at one point, this is only the one instance I've, I've come across, but it's, it's also extreme, it is referred to as a human right not to have the character of one's neighbourhood changed. Which, to my mind, to my ears, that's a really odd phrase, um, but it's a sort of interesting one to sort of, uh, I think it, it expresses very effectively um, the sorts of values that, or the investment, the emotional affective investment in a, an existing pattern of living um, and, a, and a opposition to its disruption. Um, in the, in the, most of these conflicts are in older urban neighbourhoods um, and a lot of this uh, in the suburbs every now and again it comes along because the suburbs become, because they're already, for the most part, not exclusively, lower density. Um, so, that, so to the extent that you're going to be building in the neighbourhoods and you want to increase urban density, you have to build quite high density in the suburbs. And then so you get exactly the same thing. Uh, that this destroys the character of the neighbourhood, which is mostly characterised by single family homes and so on, and not row housing and, um, and so on. Uh, this one's, a, this one's a great sort of a set of in, in subtexts to that. Um, we don't like Toronto or Vancouver, too many people, too noisy. And so there's this, the, a reaffirmation of the desire for particular sorts of suburban life. Can I ask? Is yeah. Something to do with consultation or lack of? Um, people understood. Most of these are, most of these occur in, most of these statements are, are coming from newspaper reports which are reports of consultation meetings. So they are, they're the things that people are saying in formal consultation meetings that they're being reported, obviously the, the media is going to be reporting selectively what is said there. Um, but that's a lot of this, the data is coming from it's actually exactly those processes. I don't, I, you don't see, well, I haven't seen a lot there. You might see it more in the community newsletters when we, when we get to look at that that being said, but in the newspaper stuff I've uh, gone through sort of informally now and trying to sort of develop a coding sheet to do it slightly more formally later on, that doesn't come up very explicitly a lot. Um, I'm sort of, I, was, I was half looking for it and it's not obvious. Um, as I said, the location of these conflicts is mostly in the neighbourhoods of public sector professionals um, in relatively close 
um, to the Urban Hall. Uh, those are the neighbourhoods, but not nobody else will necessarily mean much by that. But it would be it would be this sector of uh, you know it would be areas where the uh, the the median income is probably going to be what you know fifty percent higher than the average across the city as a whole, um, and it would be mostly people working in the public sector. University professors will be an absolute sort of paradigm part of the, uh, the de demographic for this opposition. Um, the other thing is that we're, if that is the case, we need to sort of, I need to get this uh, geocoding map, but it's certainly the, the, you know, looking at them informally, that is the case. Then it's also then the site, site where when you look at the aggregate data and things like public opinion about what to do, you know, what should we do something about climate change, those are also the people who will be most likely to say yes, we need to do lots about climate change, and say yes, we need to make the city more dense because they recognise that connection. Um, they will be they will be most likely to talk about some of those other sort of signifiers for that. They'll talk about livable cities or urban livability or those types of frames. So in terms of the councillors, the councillors are most most commonly opposed, uh, associated with opposition. Are those on the on the, the green or the left? Diane Holmes is uh, NDP, which is the sort of social democratic party. Although at the municipal level, there are no part, political parties in in Ontario. David Chenishan goes stood for the Green Party in, in, the, in Ottawa Centre in the 2006 and 8 general elections in Canada. And so they use mostly both the, the, the discourses of community versus the developers and uh, the preservation of historic neighbourhoods most. Um, uh, regularly, and so in some senses, the one I want to explore when we get to when we unpack it a bit more, and I think this is the, for me, is an interesting uh, well, line of inquiry as much as anything is that it is to think of it as a problem of ambivalence. That, that it's not it's not a very clear situation where you've got a set of forces that are systematically um, in favour of high carbon development, a set of forces that are systematically resisting it, but actually it's going off in daily life and as it, uh, at in, in the ambivalence that mo me most of us feel about that relationship between what, what, what we do in daily life that generates climate change and the changes that would be needed to sort of meet, uh, deal with that. Um, but we're sort of part of the resistance that's coming even from within the people who is rhetorically in favour of action. Um, this is uh, Joanne Cianello, is a, is a not a citizen, which is a local newspaper journalist, and I think she refers. I mean, she uses the word hypocrisy because it's more of a sort of journalistic term, but I think she's really capturing that sort of ambivalence here. Some residents are already complaining about backyard parking because they don't want to look at cars when they sit on their decks. They also don't want cars parking on the street because that would inhibit snow review. But, well, that's a very specific Ottawa issue. Um, and where would their guests park? They absolutely don't want to see front yards taken over by parking, yet they claim to support intensification. Now, she's using it to delegitimise them, uh, and, the, and, the, and the people are saying that, but it doesn't need to be done in that, understood in that way because you know, that, that form of government seems to me to be integral to how lots of us feel about um, those processes. Um, but ambivalence, uh, then, not necessarily what I want to explore more, is, that, is the way that our ambivalence comes out of the contradictory meanings of and desires for these practices. You know, on the one hand, lots of people will say, yeah, if you ask people, do you want to live in a single family home? Um, with half an acre, you know, a quarter of an acre of land, uh, plenty of space around you, not too much, not hearing too much noise from your neighbours. Most people say yes. On the other hand, if you ask them, do you want to be close to services, shops, schools? Do you want your kids to be able to walk to school? They also say yes, and those two um, cannot be simultaneously achieved. Um, uh, and one of the things that goes on in the political process is that the, the, the strategic actors, uh, left, right. Um, or centrist opportunists in the, in the one, um, their strategy is designed to close down the ambivalence. And the ambivalence works in favour of the status quo. Oh, sorry, closing down ambivalence works in, in favour of the status quo, would be my argument. Um, so the developers and the pro suburban, mostly conservative politicians, do that to say, we can't, you know, just to delegitimise intensification, say, no, it's like, no, we just need to have lots of support because that's what people want closing down the ambivalence, or by the opponents because they say, well, it's not about the ambivalence, it's about the power of the developers. I'm slightly more sympathetic to that claim, but I think it's also politically just like disabling to do so. Um, and so I'm sort of interested in exploring this much more, I'm working with a local NGO called Ecology Ottawa on this, um, as well as sort of talking to lots of people in the council over the next year or two 
um, to see about how what would happen when we sort of make that ambivalence much more explicit in the public discourse and make people recognise the sort of messy choices they've got to that the that, that they we have to make. Um, and I'd be very interested in if anybody's got ideas about how you do that research and, uh, and what it might be uh, uh, what it might tell us. And that is where I learned. I have no idea how long that was. That was but, uh, five minutes under, which is oh, incredibly okay. unusual. Apologies. <laughs> Thank you. You didn't get your value for money. <laughs>